Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be checking out more Oversimplified. I haven't really gone into his Mini Wars series, there's uh, I think four of them now, so I thought that would be a pretty good thing to start. I don't do Oversimplified's videos very often. Also, um, I don't know who's responsible for this, but uh, my Napoleon videos, they initially got claimed, but somebody released the claim. If that's Oversimplified, I highly appreciate it. If it's just some sort of... Uh, network stuff i i whatever whoever's responsible thank you for that i i guess i didn't even ask for it they just somebody decided to release the claim so i thought that was a uh, very cool of whomever is responsible for that so uh yeah now, now that i'm done with that part we're gonna talk about the falklands which is weird um the falklands i don't know them as much historically i've learned a little bit about them in uh geography courses which i thought is uh I, I it's it's fascinating in its uh place in the british empire uh with them being so far north and the falklands being so far south it, it really is a defining piece of the empire's range and uh i'm very curious about how the history of that actually came about because like like i said just i'm mostly know it geographically not not as much historically and how the british came to own it i i know argentina's involved but uh they're involved with a lot of land claims down there so that that's not as surprising all right let's get this started Hi, English Mariner John Strong. Hi, Anthony Carey, 5th Viscount of Falkland. I would very much like for you to go to Chile and locate the wreck of a Spanish treasure ship for me. Okay. <laughs> Just jumping right into it. Hey, I found some islands. That's not bad. That's not, not a bad find. The English were probably... You, you could find a treasure ship, which I'm, I'm sure it has a lot on it, but there, there's a lot of potential in land. land land can be reused so like uh i believe it, it was uh i don't know if the land was particularly good for like farming or whatever but i believe they had a uh, a decent animal population that I, I i don't remember if it was cows or something something like that that could potentially be valuable probably not the first to discover the falklands but they were the first to write it down they found it to be cold, wet, and miserable, just like home. So they established a colony in 1765, unaware that the French had also discovered the islands and done the same a year earlier. Oh, that's fun. The two were unaware of each other's existence until presumably there was an awkward moment where they ran into each other. <laughs> the Spanish showed up and told the French that a couple hundred huh. years earlier, the Pope drew a line on a map and said all of this belongs to Portugal and all of this belongs to Spain, and that the island was in Spain's territory and they would like the French to hand over their settlement. Now, since the... Yeah, that that's one of the early... Uh... <laughs> defining moments in that age of colonialism there's there's many different uh, ages of colonialism and there are different ways to divide it depending on how you want to look at it but uh the pope uh drawing that line in the americas it, it actually uh was huge in the uh especially the spanish empire's peak however uh that line was clearly not uh set in stone uh because they ended up falling uh quite hard from that peak and uh the british ended up stepping in for the large part they ended up just losing a lot of their colonies just on their own so uh the pope's power i guess did not manifest in this uh in this situation in the long term the two were good friends and spain was willing to pay in cash money the french obliged but since they were still a little bitter about the recent seven years war thing they made sure to warn the spanish not to let those dirty english on the other side of the island take over so uh. to the english and explained pope line on map spain's island and the english said yeah right this is our island but the spanish had more guns so they kicked them off anyway but then england threatened to go to war so spain went to their friends in france and said hey it looks like stuff is about to go down you in on this and the french minister of war said yeah and we'll launch a full-scale invasion of england and party like it's 1066 <laughs> then king louis the 15th said one you're insane and two you're fired sorry spain we're not ready for a war right now so spain had to give the Eng uh Oh, so their settlement back, saying it's still our island, and the English said, "No, it's our island." Then some colonists. Okay. 
it, it's very interesting. Uh, the Spanish and the French have a, a unique relationship when it comes to exchanging land in the New World. Uh, it happens plenty, especially in North America. So I, I'm very uh, interested in how this actually plays out. I, I think about like uh, a lot of the land in the West that went from Spanish hands to French hands to Spanish hands. And it, it, it's really interesting how that works. And there's this caveat, like, don't let the British have it. Like, I, I'm letting you have this, but don't let the British have it. And it's kind of fun that that is uh, here as well. Got a bit rowdy, so the English had to leave their settlement to go focus on that. But they left behind a plaque that USA. Totally still our island. So the island was in Spanish hands. But then a French guy, no, not that one, that one, yeah. Spanish, took over most of the country and captured King Ferdinand VII. And in response, the Spanish colonies in South America started vying for independence. So Spain had a little bit on its hands and also had to leave the islands. And for a couple decades, the so islands just were along. uninhabited except for the penguins, some fishermen, and the gauchos, which are basically huh. like cowboys but cooler and Spanisher. A merchant from Hell, That's interesting. living in the now independent United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata, heard about the feral cattle roaming the Falcons and thought it would be a good way to make some money. Okay, what well, it was cows or cattle, whatever. I I don't know the if there's like a very specific term. I don't know if cow is the cow is just specifically female. So cattle is probably a better broad term. No, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> So he got permission from both Buenos Aires and the British government to set up trade there as a private venture. Some American ships came down and began hunting whales and seals around the islands, and Vernet wasn't too happy about it. So he asked Buenos Aires for some military assistance in defending the islands, but Buenos Aires said, meh, do it yourself, gave him some weapons, hmm. and appointed him governor of the islands. So he seized the U.S. ships and arrested their crews. In response, two things happened. Oh, really? America came down and said, nice settlement you have there. Would be a shame if someone destroyed it. And then they destroyed it. Second, Britain heard Vernet had been appointed governor, meaning the United Provinces, actually now the Argentine Confederation, were officially claiming... This is, uh, I'm, I'm still, I, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting what year this is at this stage, because it, it moves so fast by virtue of oversimplified being the, uh, the title. And this is early oversimplified, so it's, uh, it's actually short. Uh, the thing with a lot of his newer videos, they'll go like 30 minutes, and yeah, some stuff is oversimplified, but he does a pretty darn good job uh, in going into a decent amount of detail on a lot of stuff. With the pacing of the old ones were a little bit more fitting for the name, so it's hard to tell exactly when this is. Early on, America's Navy was not that impressive, so if they're uh, uh, tangling with people down here, they, they are probably beatable, uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, ended up doing just fine against the Americans, if this is in that like really early stage where the Navy is not that impressive. I mean the islands as theirs, so Britain showed up and said, hey, didn't you see our plaque? And since they had more guns, they kicked them off the island. And the Falklands <laughs> remained firmly in British hands for the next century. They officially became a crown colony in 1840. Port Stanley became the island's capital in 1845. The cattle hides from the island weren't worth much, so they imported sheep from Britain in 1851. Two world wars came and went, and all this... Oh, so the cattle wasn't worth much. Okay. Uh, I've, I feel like I remember learning about the cattle, though. I think it was in a regional geography course. It, it might have come up. I, I think it was in like a broader discussion about the British Empire and stuff. And we were just talking about like the different kinds of land that they controlled and how diverse the empire was and stuff like that. But uh, OK, sheep. Sheep was the way to go. I thought the cattle would be pretty useful, but I guess they didn't think so. Time, the Argentinians never rescinded their claim over the islands. Now it's 1976, and after a couple civil wars, a new brutal military... Oh, we skipped a lot of time there. ...fight against communism has taken control in Argentina. And by 1981, this guy was in power. The economy had been struggling for a long time, and Galtieri had been unable to improve the situation. Now, if you ever find yourself the brutal military leader of a struggling South American country, and you start getting into hot water... I know where we're going here. ...that has been tried and tested throughout the centuries. 
Start a war. Yeah. One from their misery. Galtieri knew how popular he would be if he could finally take back Argentina's last Malvinas from the occupying British. There had been proposals to cut British military spending, and the ice patrol vessel HMS Endurance had been withdrawn from the area. So the Argentinians assumed the British may not even bother doing anything about the invasion. After easily capturing the largely uninhabited South Georgia island, 600 Argentine troops were sent to the Falklands. The small number of Royal Marines and other British forces stationed there put up a small amount of resistance, but. So with this, I, it makes me wonder how much this is even really worth it from a purely strategic standpoint. Like, uh, there are there's some positives and negatives. Uh, of course, having the British right next door is probably something that they don't really want at this stage. Um, but the forces are clearly not super significant. But, like, it, let's say you were able to get them out of there and you don't have them nearby any like potential threat maybe not actual threat but potential threat that they would have posed maybe mitigated but also you could end up pissing them off more and they have a very strong military very strong navy they could probably come by and uh cause you a lot of trouble so this feels uh like, the negatives kind of outweigh the positives here. Um, I understand, like, for this one guy, he is looking for kind of a symbolic victory, but for in the grand scheme of things of Argentina and its interests, it, it probably has more to lose than to gain here. But in the end, had to surrender to the larger Argentine force. Crowds in Argentina celebrated the news, but they were wrong to assume the British would do nothing because the person in charge of the United oh, Kingdom yeah. was this lady. Thatcher was a somewhat controversial prime minister, but whether you loved her or hated her, there was no denying that she was tough, like metal. Iron, for example. She immediately. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that much about Thatcher, but she definitely has that powerful reputation. She's, uh, she's associated pretty often. At, at, with uh, Ronald Reagan, who was the uh, the American president during some of the big time during when she was in charge, uh, they they were closely associated with one another. And uh, if she's anything like Reagan, which personally not a fan of Reagan, that's just me. Um, I won't deny that he had kind of a strong nature to him, and I, I'd imagine Thatcher uh, following. Perhaps a similar brand of conservatism would have uh, had kind of like that similar feel to her. Those two, they just defined conservatism for a generation, at least in the mainstream. Only now in America are we kind of teetering on like, are we still in the Reagan era or is this the Trump era now? It's kind of hard to tell because like all the re Republican presidents between Reagan and Trump uh, just felt like they were firmly part of Reagan's uh, legacy. And it makes me uh, want to learn more about Thatcher and how uh, kind of that era of conservatism translated in uh, a related but not exactly the same country. Uh, yeah. He declared an exclusion zone around the islands and organized for a task force of over 100 ships to set sail for the Falklands. The United Nations expressed concern at the Argentine invasion. All South American nations apart from Chile backed Argentina. And since the United States had propped up the Argentine dictatorship, Reagan went to Thatcher and said, could you maybe just let them have the islands? And Thatcher said, mm. no. Okay, here, have some weapons. Fighting a <laughs> See, like, e even when they're against each other, they're... they're uh, well, the United States knows how to... Uh, how to profit off of a conflict we've uh we've armed so many people some that became our problem later on uh we we sell we're we're, we're huge arms manufacturers it's it's it, are the uh the arms manufacturing industry is like in, insane in our country thousand miles from home. We don't make much, but we make guns. They requisitioned civilian cruise ships and containers, and they used British-owned Ascension Island as a forward base. By the time they arrived at the Falklands in May, the Argentine forces had had time to entrench themselves. The first task for the British was to gain control of the seas, which they did easily. On the 2nd of May, a British submarine sank an Argentine cruiser. The sinking was controversial, as it occurred outside the British exclusion zone. It was also mm. the largest loss of life in a single incident during the war. And in Jeez. response, the Argentine Navy withdrew from the islands. 
The next task for the British was to gain air superiority. While the Argentine Air Force controlled the skies, they were able to inflict considerable damage on the Royal Navy below. Days after the sinking of the General Belgrano, two Argentine Super Etendars carried out a raid on the HMS Sheffield and sank it with an Exocet missile. For weeks, the Argentine Air Force would continue to carry out raids and inflict heavy casualties on the Royal Navy, with British sea harriers doing their best to take out as many of the Argentine aircraft as they could. While the battle in the skies raged on, San Carlos was chosen as the best landing site for the British ground forces. An SAS raid took the Argentine defenses on Pebble Island, and the HMS Alacrity sailed through Falkland Sound to flush out any Argentine supply ships. The landings began on May 21st, with Argentine aircraft carrying out full-scale raids on the task force ships taking part in the landing, damaging several and sinking a few. But anti-aircraft cannons and sea harriers shot down many of the aircraft in what became a major turning point for air superiority, and a beachhead was successfully formed. Then the ground troops... This is pretty, uh, pretty scientific, how the, uh, how the British are coming in and doing this. They, they're doing... I like that they, uh, were, were consistent with the times when it came to the flags. Like, I like that earlier in the video, it was the old flag, and that here was the new flag. He, do, he doesn't really have to do that. Uh, he could just do the recognizable modern flag, and I don't think anybody except, like, real flag nerds are going to get pissed about that, but I, I appreciate the attention to detail there. Uh, how it has, like, the red X in the background, how it didn't have that early on because that wasn't, uh, that wasn't there before, but now that we're in kind of more the modern era, it has switched over. I, I wasn't paying attention to that too much, but it just occurred to me that, uh, it was a different it was a different version of the Union Jack before, so that's interesting. Troops began their movements out of San Carlos, across the north towards Stanley, and south toward the Argentine stronghold at Goose Green. In the following battles, a clear trend emerged. The Argentine conscripts put up a good fight, and with the rough, muddy terrain, the war was by no means easy for the British. But with highly skilled mm. Royal Marine commanders and parachute regiment troops, the British would often find themselves taking on larger numbers of Argentinian soldiers, but would still come out victorious with minimal casualties. The fourteen hour long battle for Goose Green commenced on the night of May twenty eighth. The the battle ended in a decisive British victory, with over 900 Argentinians surrendering. Then, with 5,000 reinforcements arriving from the 5th Infantry Brigade, the British started preparing for their final assault on Stanley. In a series of hard-fought battles, they took control of the hills and mountains surrounding the town, as the Argentine forces withdrew with British ships shelling their positions from offshore, utterly surrounding. One thing uh, before he wraps, uh, you know, I'll let him wrap this up and then I'll give my thoughts. Sorry On the 14th that. of June, the Argentinians surrendered and the war was over. The We're so close to the end. And hundreds of lives and left the island strewn with minefields that still pose a problem to this day. Argentina still claims... Ah, uh, one of those things. a referendum was held, and the islanders voted 99.8% in favor of remaining British. Plus, <laughs> it was just found near the islands, so the British oh. aren't going to give them up anytime soon. So that's it. Okay. Um, a fun thing... <laughs> You, me using the word fun again, but, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, about the British Empire, uh, you think about uh, Great Britain, and it's relatively small. It, it really is. And uh, that has impacted the way that it has operated its empire for so long that if there's any nation that can wage war from basically across the globe. Uh, I think the British are pretty capable of that sort of thing. Often having that distance from home can be a pain. It, it's a little different today. Uh, uh, connectivity is so much greater than it used to be. You don't, you, it doesn't take as long to get around the world or whatever, but it's still, that obstacle of distance is still a thing, with the British being all the way up there, if you're looking at the typical map, and the Falklands being all the way down there. Uh, it, it really still is impressive that they're able to come in and just uh, totally destroy and, and not have, like, major issues, especially with, like, Argentina, which is basically right next door they they have their supply chain right there um so yeah that, that that's really impressive how the british have always been able to do that and it's ingrained in their history they've always been able to do that they they're accustomed to being able to fight these long distance battles uh from their deep history of colonialism so I really enjoyed that one. If you'd like me to continue the Mini Wars series, I am interested in the uh, the soccer war thing. Hey, shush. I'm interested in the soccer war thing because I feel like that's something an American could not perfectly 
Oh, sorry, not the soccer war, the football war. I did it, I did the thing. Uh, I converted it in my head. Uh, the football war. Uh, I feel like that's something uh, that an American could not perfectly relate to not appreciating the sport as much, but I hear about soccer hooligans all the time, and it's like a funny uh, joke that I throw around about Europe every once in a while, even though I don't fully understand it. But it, it, it's uh, it, I, I, I enjoy the enthusiasm behind the whole thing, even though it's uh, kind of scary, theoretically. Um, like I said, don't know too much about it, but I, I'm, I'm curious about how that played out. I don't even know if that's Europe. I that could be South America. They they love soccer there too, right? Football. I'm going to say soccer because I'm an American and I'm not going to pretend I'm not. So if you guys want me to check that out, uh, let me know in the uh, comment section below. And I will see you tomorrow with another video. All right.